Welcome back everybody to Industrial Organization. This is the first video for Chapter 2. Here we're going to talk uh, mainly about the firm sort of profit maximizing decisions, but we have to start with the customer because the whole point of the firm is to create something that the customer wants to buy. And in order to do that, we need to think about demand, we need to think about elasticity, um, and so that's what we're going to do here and think about sort of, you know, uh, how changes in uh, price will affect uh, total revenue, right? Because if you, unless you are in perfect competition where price is the same no matter how much you produce, then you have to worry about the fact that when you increase the price, you're going to decrease the quantity sold uh, and vice versa. So... Here we are moving along. So we have to think starting with demand, right? And so demand comes from customers. Customers are going to think about, you know, the price of the good, substitutes available, complements available. Um, customers we generally think of as maximizing utility, but at the same time, I think it's important to, you know, realize and firms definitely realize that customers are not fully rational. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, and we'll continue to talk about that throughout the, the course. Um, we also want to think about whether, you know, a firm's demand is just sort of out there in the world or whether they can do something to, you know, increase that demand. So uh, the question here is, a is a firm's demand exogenous, where they have no control over it, or is it endogenous? Um, and I think that's a really important point, right? I think, you know, firms that spend a lot on advertising and marketing feel that it's more endogenous, uh, whereas firms that don't feel that it's more exogenous. And I think some of that has to do with product differentiation. Some of it has to do with brand. Um, but it's an important point, um, you know, one that economists like um, John Kenneth Galbraith talked a lot about in the middle of the 20th century, but that doesn't get as much attention these days, right, in the sort of rational model of the consumer. But advertising is really important. We need to think about advertising and whether it's sort of a rational thing or whether it's more of an irrational thing. So. Production technology is also going to be hugely important to a firm's production decision, right? Because we need to think about how much it's going to cost to uh, produce at different levels. We need to think about research and development, whether they can reduce those uh, production costs. Um, and those costs are going to be the flip side of the profit decision, right? And we'll think about revenue first, and then in the next video, we're going to think about costs. Um, and in terms of maximizing uh, profit, right? So if a firm is able to reduce cost, even if they don't have um, a lot of market power, that's one way for them to increase profitability. And of course there will be trade-offs, right? Should a firm uh, invest more in making a better product or should they invest more in reducing the cost to make that product? Um, that's something that firms are going to have to decide. All right, so we start, you know, with a fairly sort of standard market demand curve. Um, we've got price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis, and we're going to say that quantity demanded is going to depend on uh, the demand for good one, the price of good one. Good one is the one we're talking about. Price of good two, that's some other good, right? So if we're thinking about, you know, the demand for Coke, we need to think about the price of Pepsi. If we're thinking about the demand for Volkswagens, uh, we need to think about the price of Toyotas. Um, we're going to think about the income of uh, somebody, right? Because generally for most goods, for most what we call normal goods, when income goes up, demand goes up. There will be some inferior goods where that's not the case. Uh, and then tastes, right? Tastes uh, of good um, eye. And that's a little bit, or a person eye, really. That's going to vary. So that's going to be where we talk about the difference between, say, horizontal differentiation and vertical differentiation. With vertical differentiation, we're talking about quality. And the idea here is that people can agree on, you know, which is the higher quality product. So, you know, uh, we might all agree that a BMW is a higher quality product than a Hyundai. Um, but tastes, we can say, okay, well, people can disagree about tastes, right? Some people might prefer a Toyota. Some people might prefer a Honda. Some people might prefer Coke. Some people might prefer uh, Pepsi. Um, so the uh, phrase that economists have used is de gustibus non est disputandum. So if you want to be fun at parties, you can say that um, basically it just means there's no point in arguing about tastes. People have different tastes. 
So let's think about two sort of pieces of demand. One is the level of demand, right? So when we use a linear demand curve, and remember we're only using a linear demand curve because it makes the math easier, um, but we can think of that as where the intercept is. And so some you know, advertising and marketing might be to increase uh, the level of demand um, through you know making more people aware of their product and how you know what a great product it is or you know you can develop a better product and people be like oh that's really great i want to buy that uh, then we want to think about the elasticity of demand which we'll talk about in a lot more detail because it's a little more complicated basically whenever we think elasticity in economics we want to think a percent change due to a percent change so our price elasticity of demand is going to be the percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in price. We'll also talk about income elasticity of demand. We can talk about supply elasticity. Um, whenever we think elasticity, think percent change divided by a percent change. Um, that can depend. So the you know the, our regular sort of price elasticity of demand can depend on a lot of different things. How differentiated a product is. How, you know how available there are substitutes, uh, complements. Um, so we want to think about that as well. All right. So our price elasticity. Now we have this issue that different textbooks deal with it a little bit differently. Uh, demand always slopes down, right? So when we have a downward sloping demand, that means the slope and therefore what we would usually think of as the elasticity is going to be negative, right? Um, so what this book does is say, okay, well, Epsilon can be negative, but we're going to talk about eta, which is this little n here, right? Um, and we want that to be positive. So we're just going to call it the negative of epsilon or the negative of what some books call the elasticity. And so everybody handles it a little bit differently. But basically, it's the percent change in quantity divided by the percent change in price. Um, we can think of that in terms of partial derivatives, right, where it's the derivative of Q with respect to P times P divided by Q. Um, in our linear inverse demand, right, our, it's, we have P equals A minus BQ. So the DQ DP is just the, the slope or 1 over B. And then we can multiply that times P over Q. So now we're down here. And we get the slope 1 over B, which is delta Q delta P times P over Q, and then we substitute back in our linear uh, inverse demand function, A minus B over Q, and then we just simplify it a little bit so that we collect like terms. Uh, we get A over BQ in this first term minus one, right? Because the B's cancel out and the Q's cancel out um, in that uh, second term. So. Something to note here in our linear demand, uh, there's going to be a special point um, where eta equals one, um, and where basically you know our revenue is going to be neutral with respect to a small price change. And up here, eta is going to be larger than one, which means that our percent uh, change in quantity demanded is larger than our percent change in price. So if we reduce our price, our revenue is going up. And then down here, where we have eta is less than 1, that means revenue is going to go up if we decrease our price because we're selling more. And so let's, let's take more of a look at, at that in just a minute. There are lots of other elasticities in economics. Um, so, you know, if you, you want to get comfortable with elasticities if you're doing economics. One is income elasticity. So this is the percent change in quantity demanded due to a percent change in income, which we can write as delta Q over delta M times M over Q. Um, it will be positive for normal goods and negative for inferior goods. So note that we didn't put a negative uh, in there um, because the sign of the income elasticity actually tells us something. Thing. Um, similarly, for our cross price elasticity, this is the percent change in quantity demanded for one good, which we'll call good I, uh, due to a percent change in the price of good J. So for some goods, it will just be zero, right? They won't be related. But if it's positive, that means they're substitute. So if the price of J goes up, the demand for good I uh, goes up because you don't buy J and you do buy I, and it'll be negative for complements, right? So 
you know, if the price of gasoline goes up, then the demand for big SUVs that use a lot of gasoline will go down. Um, and so it will be negative for complements. So those are two other elasticities that we'll talk about some uh, in this class that you should be aware of. But as I said, there are lots of other elasticities as well. So, all right, so let's think about total revenue, right? So we're ignoring cost right now. And we know that firms don't really want to maximize total revenue, at least not usually. Sometimes firms, when they are starting out, do try to, you know, sort of maximize total revenue. Um, here, what we have, so we're just going to say total revenue is price times quantity, but we know that price is a function of quantity because of our demand curve. Um, we want to think about average revenue, right? So average revenue is just total revenue divided by quantity, which of course is just price. We also want to think about marginal revenue. So remember in economics, whenever we say marginal, we're thinking about, well, one more, right? So what is the change in revenue due to selling one more uh, unit? Um, and so we can think of this as a derivative, right? The derivative of total revenue with respect to quantity. Um, of course, in the real world, we'd probably just think about it as you know, the change in revenue due to change selling one more unit since you can't sell, you know, an infinitesimal piece of something usually. Um, so what is that marginal revenue? That's going to be really important. As we'll see, it's not always positive, right? Because firms are facing a downward sloping demand curve. Whenever they increase the price, the quantity goes down. And whenever they reduce the price, the quantity goes up. And so for some parts, as we said, uh, ADA will be positive and revenue will be increasing as price goes up. But then ADA will turn uh, to be less than one. And as you increase the price, quantity goes down even more. And eventually, of course, your price is so high that you can't sell uh, anything. So we can sort of do the math, right? So our marginal revenue is the uh, derivative of total revenue uh, with respect to quantity. Uh, the partial. Um, so we can substitute in our uh, formula for total revenue, which is just uh, price as a function of quantity times quantity. Um, that's just going to be price plus the partial derivative of price with respect to quantity times quantity. That's this Q that's got left over here. Um, we can factor out a P. Um, now, factoring out a P from P just leaves one. Now, we don't actually have a P in this term. So how do you factor out a P when there is no P? Well, you put one in the denominator. That's a, a math trick that um, you, you often see. Mathematicians are good at it. I'm not so good at it. Um, but this term now is just the inverse of our elasticity, of our eta. Um, and so we can actually solve this equation for eta and say eta is equal to the price divided by price minus marginal revenue. Um, and of course, if we do that, we get this with our linear equation, right? We get the same thing that we did before. Um, so our marginal revenue here, here is our total revenue, A times Q minus B times Q squared, right? And we're just substituting in our formula for P of Q. We take a derivative of our revenue with respect to Q, we get A, because that was just a linear term, minus 2BQ, because that was a quadratic term, so we multiply by 2, and we're left with just a linear Q. Um, and then we can say, okay, well, we can substitute that into our equation, and we get eta is equal to uh, A over BQ minus 1, um, which is the same as we had before, right? We just are substituting in there. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if that's super interesting or not. Um, obviously, this you know this is just with linear demand. Demand is not necessarily linear, but maybe it makes it a little bit easier to see. Um, if we look at our total revenue curve, now we can see sort of what's going on, right? We know it's a quadratic from you know what we just did. Um, we know it's a negative quadratic, so it has a maximum. Um, and basically what this means is that, you know, as you're increasing, as you're decreasing price and selling more, revenue goes up to this point. That's the maximum revenue that you can have, not necessarily the maximum profit that you can have. And then if you keep decreasing the price in order to sell more, eventually uh, 
revenue goes down and eventually hits zero. So over here, the price is so high that nobody buys. And over here, the price is zero. And so lots of people buy, but you don't actually make any money. Um, so that's the, the key there is that it's not always better to sell more, whether we're talking about profit or revenue. Now, that's sort of our, our basic demand. There are lots of other uh, pieces of demand that we're going to talk about. So one is a bandwagon effect, which the, the book kind of talks about the network effect with the bandwagon effect. I think the network effect is a little bit different. Bandwagon effect basically means, hey, everybody's doing it, so I might as well do it too. Um, and that's definitely you know true to some extent. Um, the network effect is really that there's more value to a product the more people that are using it. So whether we're talking about um, you know iPhones and the you know messaging between iPhones, or we're talking about um, you know Microsoft Office and everybody's doing Word and Excel, and so it's more valuable if I use it as well. Um, so network effects are are really important in the digital age, and we'll we'll come back to them. Uh, the snob effect is you know just well I. This is what I do to sort of differentiate myself, whether it's, you know, drinking fancy coffee or fancy wine or fancy cars or whatever. Uh, the Veblen effect is a little bit similar to the snob effect. It's sort of conspicuous consumption. The idea is that you're, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses. And so, you know, you might have to have that fancy car or the pool in the backyard because all your neighbors do. There's lots of other sort of um, not completely rational pieces of demand uh, that we'll talk about a little bit more as we go on. Um, but we're going to stop there uh, for right now. Um, in the next video for Chapter 2, we will talk more about uh, costs specifically and profit maximization, um, which is really what firms worry about rather than uh, total revenue maximization.